Hello, friends. Welcome to Science Talk. I am your host, Jim Massa. So this is a, an article, an editorial that appeared on the uh, web page Project Syndicate, project-syndicate.org, forward slash commentary, forward slash Arctic sea ice depletion, so on. And what are we talking about here? Pine bomb at the top of the world. Written by uh, Mario Molina and Derwood uh, Zelke. Unfortunately, Mr. Uh, Molino uh, passed away uh, in between when these two gentlemen uh, finished the article and it got published. But what we're we talking about here, people all over the world are already losing their homes and livelihoods to deadly fires, floods, storms, other disasters. With scientists now expecting the Arctic Ocean to be almost ice free in late summer, worse is yet to come. And try to imagine more devastating effects of climate change than the fires that have been raging in California, Oregon, and Washington, or the procession of hurricanes, right? All lined up like beads on a, on a string there that have approached and at times ravaged the Gulf Coast and deadly heat waves in India, Pakistan, Europe, right? And don't forget the fires that hit Australia, the fires raging across the Arctic, the fires in Africa, the fires in Brazil. There's fires on every major continent. You know, now they have a new term, giga fires, basically fires that burn more than a million acres. Not to mention the pyrocumulus cloud, fire tornadoes, all sorts of crazy shits happening. There's, there's far more with one risk in particular, so great it alone threatens humanity itself. The rapid depletion of Arctic sea ice. So this so-called climate bomb as a time is being watched with growing anxiety. A lot of scientists are concerned about that. Each September, the extent of Arctic sea ice reaches its lowest level before the lengthening darkness and, and the, the falling temperatures cause it to begin to expand again. Remember, summer is uh, September is the oceanic summer. March is the oceanic winter. It's about a three-month lag between what happens on the land to what happens in this in the ocean, and that's because of the, the specific heat of water. It takes longer to warm up, but also takes longer to cool down. Now you can tie that in with the angle of the sun, etc. Measurements from the NSIDC in Boulder, Colorado, show that there's less ice in the middle of the Arctic than ever before. Just published research shows that winter sea ice in the Arctic's Bering Sea hit its lowest level in 5,500 years in 2018, 2019. You don't even see ice going through the Bering Strait into the Bering Sea. You don't see it anymore. It used to be. You don't see that anymore. Now we're barely forming the ice in the Chukchi, which is just north of the Bering Strait itself. You don't see that anymore. Okay. Uh, we just now found out that, like, take the Laptev Sea, for example. That is the lowest... Uh, sea ice extent ever in this data and now we're seeing that for the entire arctic uh, ice that by the time october 2020 rolled around we broke a record for the lowest sea ice extent period in 41 years of satellite data when those it has surpassed the 2012 levels over the entire arctic sea ice reaches its second lowest extent ever on september 15th it is now the lowest extent when October rolled around, by the middle of October. Amounts vary from year to year, but the trend is inexorably downward. The 14 Septembers with the least sea ice have all been in the last 14 years. You think you see a pattern? The sea ice is not only covering less area, it is thinner than ever. In other words, you're losing the multi-year sea ice. Thinner ice can melt more readily. The oldest sea ice, more than four years old, which is more resistant to melting, now comprises less than 1% of all sea ice cover. First year ice now dominates, leaving the sea cover more fragile, quicker.
quicker to melt. And science is now the BOE. They now expect that to be ice free in a late summer within a decade or two, if not ice free year round by the middle of 20, you know, 2030s, 2035, 2040, somewhere in there. Effects could be would be catastrophic in the extreme scenario, which could happen within decades. Loss of all ice during the entirety of the sunlit months would produce global radiative heating equivalent to adding 1 trillion tons of CO2 to the atmosphere. Translation, you don't have the ice to reflect the sun energy back into space, i.e. no albedo. So now the oceans absorb all that energy, warming the, the hell up out of the place. Put this in perspective. In the 270 years since the Industrial Revolution began, 2.4 trillion tons of CO2 have been added to the atmosphere. 2.4 trillion, with a T, tons of CO2 input into the atmosphere. About 30% of the Arctic warming has already been added to the climate because of the ice loss between 79 and 2016. More warming follows quickly as more of the remaining ice is lost. This extreme scenario would drive climate change forward by 25 years, hardly far-fetched. Just last month, a block of ice about twice the size of Manhattan broke off from the largest remaining Arctic ice shelf in northeast Greenland after record summer temperatures. Meanwhile, on land, the Greenland ice sheet is also in peril, with Arctic warming occurring at least twice as fast as average global warming. Greenland's rate of melting has at least tripled over the last two decades. It is thought that this will become irreversible in a decade or less. Eventually, this melting will cause sea levels to rise up by seven meters, drowning coastal cities, though this peak will most likely not be reached for hundreds of years. Optimistic. And let's not forget what that all that freshwater input will do to the con to AMOC and the, the conveyor belt. Keep that in mind, folks. Compounding the problem of accelerating Arctic warming is the self-reinforcing positive feedback risk of permafrost thawing. Without twice as much carbon locked away in permafrost as is, as is already in the atmosphere, re releasing even some of it could be disastrous. You release a, a good proportion of it, very disastrous. Permafrost thawing would release more potent greenhouse gases, nitrous oxide, and methane. Global temperatures rise. It is also is possible even more methane could be emitted from the East Siberian Arctic Shelf, the ESAS, shallow seabed. Now, I'm going to pause here for a bit because recently there was a whole interesting exchange going on in Twitterverse about ESAS. What happened was uh, someone from The Guardian posted an article where the scientist was concerned about the methane time bomb. And this is stating, and it was two scientists, basically saying that their research is indicating that there's quite a bit there on the ESAS. It is being released now. It is being released quickly, and they're concerned about how much is going to be released, how, how much is there to be released, and this will have very dire consequences. So people came out saying, well, this, you know, this hasn't been peer reviewed. And so don't be jumping to the doomer scenario and, you know, be cautious and all that stuff. Hey, this is typical scientific debate. I've been in the middle of a few of these myself. So that's to be expected. It's what we do. You know, we sit there and we, you know, we, we challenge each other. But the thing is, the the article in the Guardian said this is preliminary. But who are the scientists involved? Igor Semelotov, Natalia Shakova. They've been doing this for over twenty years. They know what they're doing. They have their methodology down pat they got their collect you know collecting the data down pat they got their analyses down pat they know what they're doing they published a very important paper in 2010 uh, outlining the problem 
of methane and the permafrost, methane in places like the ESAS around the, uh, and they've been shown being, to be correct. So you know, some of these other people were saying, well, our results don't agree with this. Okay. And when you write your, you know, your discussion section, you basically talk about how your findings compare to other studies or the agreements or disagreement, that kind of stuff. But the thing is, when I looked at the other the other researchers that they didn't find uh, that they didn't have the same result that there's really not that much methane. There was uh, I had some issues with the the modeling and with the, uh, the some of the methodology. It's it's the assumptions more, more the assumptions why I thought need to be tweaked a bit. Let's put it that way. Um, so, and then other scientists weighing in saying, uh, you know, it was really not that much in there and any methane for the release is going to be, you know, it's not going to make it to the atmosphere and so on. It's like, how do you know? Are we measuring that? Well, Igor and Natalia have been measuring that and they're showing that it is reaching the atmosphere. Sure, some of it will be absorbed by the ocean, you know, gases, you know, dissolve, especially, you know, the Arctic Ocean is a, has cooler water temperatures, solubility gases increases with a decrease in temperatures, vice versa. So yes, you can expect some of the gas to go into solution, but not all of it. And and we're seeing also there's a Norwegian team that documented methane just gushing out of the you know the seabed, you know, over on the uh, the Atlantic side of the Arctic. So you, there is, and this is the question that has been raised by many of the, especially Natalia and Igor, how much methane is there, be it in the permafrost, be it in the seabed, the clathrates, the hydrates, how much is there? And what is the rate of release? So it was interesting seeing this back and forth. And uh, thanks to uh, Sandy at the Environmental Coffee House, who, uh, put me onto this thread here. I read it with a sort of amusement. And the only thing I, I chimed in with was, uh, you know, someone was basically saying, well, this, uh, this scientist is, you know, making crazy assumptions, this and the other thing. So I basically said, which scientists are you referring to? If you, if you're referring to Igor, I can, I personally know the guy I work with them and, uh, uh he's a damn good scientist. He's not, he's not one for hyperbole or making bad assumptions or what or uh, given to wild you know leaps of whatever he's a solid scientist and he's well respected so and and, and that was the uh, essence of another tweet i sent out basically saying hey these guys know what the hell they're doing and you know but yeah that's, that's what we do we argue <laughs> we uh we, we argue we challenge each other uh, we push each other you know because we want to do the best science possible so that was going on. Uh, anyway, so I, I digress for a wee bit, but I have to mention that here. So uh, obviously, uh, but you know, the, not only the ESAS, but all over the Arctic realm, be it on the land or in the sea, uh, the methane problem is a major problem. And the, the at least on the terrestrial side of things, uh, the, the release of methane is increasing. It's increasing exponentially. And in Siberia, we've got, you know, you know sinkholes and craters and all sorts of crap happening as, you know, methane formed gas and it goes boom. <laughs> you know, and then there's a hole where it used to be ground. But the methane blew out. So you start getting all these, you know, if you get a big event, you know, does the earth burp or fart? But that's, that's a major concern because you could have a sudden infusion of shitloads of methane all at once. So obviously we need to mitigate this stuff here. Um, studies show that even rapid cuts in CO2 would mitigate only about 0.1 to 0.3 percent, uh, 0.3 degrees C of CO2 warming by 2050. Rapid cuts would not reduce it by much. This is why it's vital to cut drastically emissions of so-called short-lived climate pollutants, methane, black carbon, hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs, and tropospheric ozone. 
Such action could mitigate six times as much warming as reductions in CO2 emissions by 2050. Overall, eliminating emissions of these super pollutants would halve the rate of overall global warming and reduce projected ar Arctic warming by two thirds. Some progress is being made. Almost four years ago in uh, Kigali, Rwanda, 197 countries adopted an amendment to the Montreal Protocol focused on phasing out HFCs. And already the Montreal Protocol has facilitated the phase out of nearly 100 chemicals that fuel global warming and endangered the ozone layer, although it's now been found an ozone layer over Antarctica has opened up again. More, moreover, in the U.S., the Senate reached a bipartisan deal last month to cut the production, importation of HFCs by 85% by 2036. California, for its part, has slashed black carbon emissions by 90% since the 1960s and will have the remainder by 2030. The U.S. Climate Alliance, bipartisan group of 25 state governors, has set the goal of reducing methane emissions by 40 to 50% by 2030. Okay, these are laudable goals, but reaching them, let alone the more ambitious targets needed to stem the rise in global temperatures, will require us to, we've got a lot to overcome. And, and you see a quick note here, Mario Molina died during the preparation of this commentary. And you can click on the link there for a tribute. So, <clears throat> it's agreed. The thrust of this is that all, there's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of bad stuff going on, and then there's a, not just methane, but everything that's going on is a time bomb for the world. You've heard me say it before, what happens in the Arctic does not stay in the Arctic. It will affect the entire planet. Thank you for your time. Hello, folks. This is Jim here with Science Talk asking you to please subscribe to my channel and to inform others of my channel and of the work that I do. Please share to social media platforms that you use. Also, as a reminder, don't forget to click the bell so that you know when I load up more videos. Finally, I ask that you support the work that I do by becoming a patron at patreon.com. Details in the description box below. Thank you for your support.